Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Radio Lab. I'm Jad Abumrad. And I'm Robert Krolwich. Today our program is about music. We ended our last segment with a, a look back at a very famous riot in 1913 and a composer, Igor Stravinsky, whose primary objective was to create something new and dissonant and disturbing. Right now, we'll present... The opposite. The opposite. The unstravinsky. The anti-stravinsky, <laughs> in a way. What we mean is that we're going to introduce you to a guy who has invented a new, radically innovative and ingenious way of creating something old. Hey there. Are you Ellen? I am. Are you David? Uh, I'm David. Nice His name is David yeah, Cope. He works and teaches composition at UC Santa Cruz in California. And recently, our producer, Ellen Horn, was in the area. And it is a beautiful area. Uh, it, it's 22.5 miles. Wow. And she paid him a visit. It's extraordinary. And they're like birds. We've got a, we've got, you know, I have nests in each window each year. Do you really? And sure, and this one's over here. You can take a look if you'd like. <whistles> Come back in. It's okay. It's just me. Come on. Get back in your nest, Mom. She usually she'll just hop right back in when she hears me talk. Aren't you going to listen to me? Oh, this was beside the point, because we'd actually come to talk to David Cope, not about nature, but actually about something unnatural that he'd done, which started about 20 years ago. In 1980, I had a, uh, a commission for an opera, which involved actual money, which had been given up front, and which, by the way, since I had four small children, I had already spent. And uh, for the first time in my life, uh, I suffered a composer's block. It was like somebody just shot me. You know, here I should be at the height of my creative power, and I can't find a reason to compose a first note. Uh, C sharp uh, sounded no more interesting than C natural or D, and notes just didn't make any sense to me. I was really lost. I can't think of anything worse, because it's not my profession. It's what I am. A short time later, David Cope is at a party. And he finds himself talking to a guy who programs computers. And he was asking me how things were going, and I just simply said, uh, you know, it's a nightmare. And we talked through it, you know, and I, I think I must have initiated it by saying, are there any intelligent programs out there that could, I could possibly use to help me through this? And he said, well, there aren't any intelligent programs, period. But he said, you don't really need one. Don't you really just need some kind of a foil? He called it that. And I, I really had an epiphany. What I would do is build not so much a composing engine, but an analytical engine. A computer. It took him years to build. And that's it? This is... This is, this is Emmy right here. This is, this is... Emmy is the computer's name, spelled E-M-I. Emmy is an acronym for Experiments in Musical Intelligence. And what he built Emmy to do is analyze things, specifically notes. Treat notes like data. In other words, he'll feed Emmy a bunch of sheet music. For example, Bach Krell's... Emmy will then convert every single note on the page into numbers. Wow, can you describe what you see on the screen? Well, there's thousands and thousands of numbers. There are five numbers for each note. Numbers which represent all kinds of things. Uh, the on time, the pitch, the duration. A chorale becomes a huge mass of information, which Emmy then sorts through, looking for patterns. Hmm, note 450 always seems to be followed by note 456, loud and then soft. She will find the patterns. Every composer has them, the little things they do. The DNA of the individual. Now, finding all the patterns, mapping the creative DNA of a composer, is in and of itself not all that interesting. It's what happens next, which is the spooky part. Cope hits a few buttons, and all the DNA starts to recombine. Ghosts stir in the machine. Emmy Mahler... Emmy Beethoven. Even Scott Joplin. And of course, his favorite, Bach. Of course, then I became very excited about this prospect and immediately put in some cope. And sure enough, my opera, which had taken, I don't know, by the time I was I put in the cope, it was maybe five years had passed. Uh, the opera was written in about 10 days. So as a demonstration, 
I'm going to play for you the, the opening of a chorale that was composed in 1987 uh, in the style of Bach, one of the first ones that came out of the program. Now, this chorale was so bad, it sounded to me when I first heard it, that I, I, almost, I threw it away. I put it in the trash can. And then I said, well, there's something about that that I kind of like. And I pulled it out again. And thank God I did, because it's my, one of my favorite pieces the program ever produced. So here's what it sounds like as a machine would play it. You can hear the rigidity of the performance, the machine-like rigor of the meter being processed and all the notes being processed at precisely the right time with these timbres, these sonorities, which are egregious. I mean, they're just terrible. Now I'm, I'm going to play for you the same chorale as performed uh, by a group of singers uh, a while later. Same piece of music, incredibly human, personal, musical, going someplace, intriguing. I want to hear more of the second one. I'm glad I turned off the first one when I did. Oh, the number of negative reactions far, far outnumber the positive reactions. Can you um, remember, recall one in particular, one that... Oh, yeah. I was at a conference in Germany in which a colleague uh, hit me in the nose with his finger. I'm, a, I'm pretty much of a coward physically. He, you know, he was bigger than I, so it was, it was uh, quite a moment. But there have been many, many occasions, you know, shouting matches. If you've spent a good portion of your life being in love with you know, these dead composers. I mean, that sounds horrible, but you know what I mean. And along comes some twerp who claims to have this little piece of software, which he says isn't even much at all, that can, can, can move you in the same way. Suddenly you're saying to yourself, well, what's happened here? Certainly my, my, my relationship to the original pieces of music has cheapened in some way. I mean, what, is Chopin really just nothing more than a bunch of cliches strung together? I hurt with them in a way, and when they hurt, um, I feel successful, and I also feel very bad. I mean, I'm messing with some pretty powerful relationships here, and doing so in a mechanical way. If I had done it myself as a human being, these individuals could probably live with it. Because after all, they could say, well, you know, he's just really good at that sort of thing. But somehow using Hal, you know, or some version of Hal, is the ultimate insult. There is nothing intelligent about my program in the slightest. Nothing intelligent about it. I could do everything it did if it gave me ten years. I just don't have that amount of time. I'd rather spend five minutes. Thank you very much. We did a, a concert here of Bach, of Emmy Bach. And the middle movement is just adorable. I mean, it's just lovely. And, and a friend of mine was sitting in the back of the hall next to an ancient lady. She must have been in her 80s, late 80s. And she couldn't read very well, so she hadn't read the program notes. And she really just was at this concert because friends told her she didn't know what it was all about or anything like that. But she knew all about music, and she loved Bach. And, and she listened to that. And she turned to my friend and said, Oh, that was just beautiful. And my friend started to say, But do you know that it was... And then he said, Well, the hell with that. It was the reaction that I hope people will have 100 years from now if, if by some weird fluke, this stuff hangs around long enough to still be around then. Um, that I hope we can put aside all this machine trapping stuff and, and really just deal with the music itself.
That piece was produced by Jonathan Mitchell and recorded by our producer, Ellen Horn. David Cope composes and teaches at UC Santa Cruz in California. If you'd like to hear any more compositions by his computer, Emmy, and there are hundreds, you can visit our website, radiolab.org. There you will find Emmy Bach, Emmy Chopin, Emmy Scott Joplin, even Emmy Navajo music. <laughs> and the scary part is that much of it is quite good. Emmy Navajo music. Yep. Um, well, I guess we should sign off, right? Yes. Uh, I'm just still thinking about Emmy Navajo music. Actually, you know what? Let's let Emmy take us out. Oh. This is actually uh, your favorite composer, as reanimated by Emmy the Computer. Mahler? Emmy Mahler. Huh. Oh, damn. You know, this is it's very troubling. This is very troubling. <laughs> And for more information on anything you heard this hour, check our website, radiolab.org. And while you're there, communicate with us. Radiolab at wnyc.org is the address. This is Radiolab. I'm Jad Abumrad. Robert Krolwich and I are signing off. Okay, here we go. Radiolab is produced by Jad Abumrad and Ellen Horn, with help from Sarah Pellegrini, Arwin Curry, Casey Edwards, Sally Hershitz, Melissa Keeble, David Martin, Michael Shelley, Amber Seeley, Laura Vitali, and special thanks to Eileen Delahunty, John Elliott, and the LaGuardia High School Chorus, which includes Anna Carey, Melanie Charles, Jack Fuller, Lucas Isidoro, Horace Michael, Jonathan Roberts, Jessica Rosario, and Pia Toscano. Special thanks to cellist Ruben Codelli, and also... Special thanks to me, Diana Deutsch. Program management by Dean Capello and Michael El Radio Radiolab is produced by New York Public Radio and distributed by NPR. How's that? Okay, bye. <laughs>